and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden have finally met virtually on Tuesday Beijing time. They discuss and exchange views on strategic, comprehensive and fundamental issues pertaining to bilateral relations. And last week, the world's two largest economies surprised the world with a joint declaration on climate change. But they also exchanged heated words over Taiwan. So what did the meeting of the two leaders reveal about the future of this complicated relationship? And can the two countries find a better path for peaceful coexistence? But to discuss these issues and more, I'm joined by Dr. Wang Hui Yao, Counselor of the China State Council, and Professor Carl Fei from the School of Business at Alta University, and also Professor Peter Kuznick, Professor of History at American University. That is our topic. I'm Li Chiu Yuan. So the first summit between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden was held Tuesday morning, Beijing time, following phone calls in February and September. Let me start with you, Mr. Wan. What do you think of the topics of concern from each side? Were there any deliverables from the meeting? Well, I think this is really a highly relevant and a very timely uh, summit being held uh, by President Xi and President Biden. The face-to-face -face virtually first time uh, since uh, President Biden uh, inaugurated uh, in February this year. So I think this has sent a, a lot of messages because this summit was held at just uh, after COP26 concluded, where China and U.S. also had a joint statement. Also, it was a G20 concluded not too long ago, and also Asia-Pacific summit just concluded not too long ago. So this is really a high level. I think that uh, President Xi called the President Biden an old friend uh, at the beginning. It uh, shows uh, shortened the distance between China and the U.S., but also, I think that's importantly, there's a lot of substantial messages because uh, President Xi laid out that we should really uh, peacefully coexistence. You know, we should respect each other. Being the two largest economy, we should hold the responsibility for the world uh, being. As global villagers, we should really uh, work, uh, you know, for the safety of the, of the mankind, uh, fighting pandemic and also climate change. But I'm also pleased to hear that uh, President Biden uh, to say that uh, he is not support Taiwan independence He's not going to change China, seek change in China. Also, he's not uh, uh, seeking, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, contain China. So that's, uh, I think, a, a good message to hear. And uh, I think this has sent enormous uh, uh, messages uh, across both U.S. and China and around the world. So that can probably stabilize the U.S.-China relationship, at least, you know, stabilize the downward spiral of the uh, deteriorated bilateral relations. Hopefully, I think after this summit, we can kick up all those good messages and at the directions of both uh, head of state, we can push the bilateral relation forward. And also that was really all expected by the uh, China and the U.S. and by the rest of the world. Well, this is a meeting that lasted more than longer than expected, right? Three and a half hours and the first summit after Biden took office between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden. Professor Kuznick, do you think the meeting was constructive enough? Did they reach some common ground? I think it was very constructive, just the fact that they're talking rather than hurling insults at each other is positive at this point. There were no major deliverables from what I've been able to see so far, but at least they're talking in a friendly way. You compare that with the exchange in Anchorage back in March between the top U.S. and top Chinese officials which was anything but civil. It was hostile. It was aggressive. It was accusatory. This is not that. Biden and Xi Jinping have known each other since 2012. They've been on friendly terms. They've spent time together. And they can deal with each other as people. It would be much better had they met in person. That would have been much more positive. But in this case, still, there were a lot of positive signs between the two of them. Now we've got to see what's going to happen, because the situation around Taiwan especially has been very, very troublesome mm -hmm. to the world community, as the U.S. and China are inching closer toward military confrontation over Taiwan. Other issues are also quite contentious. So this is a step back from military confrontation, and hopefully we can begin to understand each other's positions better and work together. And they didn't shy away from those contentious issues, right? And we've seen statements from both sides, even as the talks were underway. And Professor Fay, let me bring you into this. How do you look at 
the remarks by the two presidents. I mean, what can we learn about their expectations as to what's to come for the relations between China and the U.S.? Well, I, I think the most important thing is that uh, they're talking, as has been mentioned. Uh, indeed, uh, there's been really heightened tensions uh, recently, and I don't think anyone expected a lot of really concrete uh, things coming out of this uh, meeting. The important thing was that they're talking. And I think uh, the conversation seems, from what we can learn, to have been positive. They have known each other for a long time. Uh, the remarks uh, you know, were, were more friendly than they have been in the past. I think that uh, you know uh, both sides were uh, wanting to talk about uh, Taiwan, human rights, trade, and, and environment, and many other issues. It's of course uh, really positive last week that uh, we saw um, the large agreement on the environment, and I think it's a good strategy uh, for both sides to try to find an issue that they can work on, which seems to be the environment. I think there's some real possibilities for very concrete progress there. Um, I think it's also important to realize that uh, Biden has been really occupied with a lot of domestic issues. Um, and maybe now that he's gotten the infrastructure package uh, signed recently uh, on the same day, in fact, of their meeting, uh, they can uh, move forward and uh, pay more attention to China. What I'm hoping is that there will be uh, more frequent meetings like this, not only uh, by Biden and Xi, but by other people uh, from the government. And I would really hope that there could be an in-person meeting at some point, as I think uh, that really helps uh, to build the chemistry. Uh, but I'm not very optimistic that an in-person meeting will happen very soon. You know, it's been uh, uh, coming up on two years that uh, President Xi has, has been in China. So it seems the only likely uh, possibility for a meeting will be uh, if Biden decides to go to China. What do you think, Mr. Wang? Any time for a possible in-person meeting? Well, it's quite possible. I think that, uh, you know, as a previous speaker mentioned, you know, President Biden has finally signed the uh, uh, infrastructure bill, I mean, uh, yesterday, and uh, now he can, uh, you know, free a lot of his attention and time uh, towards the international affairs. And then international affairs, China, uh, sino U.S. relations is the most important uh, relation uh, that the U.S. having uh, right now on the bilateral basis. So, so I think the same is true for China. So, so I think that uh, now they have a set, uh, set a tune, they have a set uh, uh, a good foundation, they have, uh, uh, have the instructed both working levels to continue. Uh, uh, positive dialogues, I, I'm sure that will come. I hope that uh, President Biden can come uh, for the Winter Olympics. You know, <laughs> that would be a good occasion in a few months' time that uh, President Biden comes for the Beijing Olympic opening ceremony, and uh, that will be a great time to, to talk again and uh, really also uh, uh, to fulfill the, the needs of uh, stabilizing the uh, economy, uh, you know, lowering down inflation, uh, you know, uh, making effective the global value chain supply. So China and U.S. have a lot of things to talk, and particularly fighting pandemic. I think both, com both countries and the, the two largest economies have a moral responsibility to really show the world how they can uh, fight pandemic together. China already donated two billion uh, vaccine to the world. U.S. has donated one billion vaccine to the world. But they should maybe work together, you know, set the global uh, <laughs> standards of how we can fight together. I think that leadership is, is extremely uh, lacking right now. We really hope that this summit can pave the way for that uh, cooperation. Oh, and also the for the Olympics. infrastructure. Uh, that could be a good proposal. And, you know, during the summit, President Xi outlined three principles and four priority areas to develop the bilateral ties. So let's delve into this for a bit, Mr. Wang. What's your take on these principles and priorities? Why were they underscored at this more important meeting? No, I think this is a, a great meeting that uh, we actually need to understand each other better. You know, not really uh, uh, hijacked by, by, by the uh, nationalism, uh, populism of uh, both countries. So I think this is really important that they talk face to face. Mm -hmm. And uh, so China, President Xi has, uh, you know, uh, emphasized the Chinese principle. Particularly, I think it's important that they mention about, uh, uh, you know, this one China policy uh, principle and uh, Taiwan is, uh, is an important issue, a mm -hmm. core interest in, and, uh, and uh, that both countries should respect uh, each other's core interests. So I think President Biden understand that. And President Biden actually said he's not supporting Taiwan independence. He's not seeking to change China. He's not seeking alliance against China. So that's an enormous message to send. You know, what about uh, you know, Quad? What about uh, 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 AUKUS and things like that? So if, that, if they're not seeking alliance against China, that send a message to, to India, Australia, and to European countries. You know, we should see a recovery of, uh, 
uh, rational and uh, constructive talks mm -hmm. uh, for the world. So, so I think this is really positive uh, signals, uh, 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 at least uh, uh, way looking forward. Right. Uh, uplifting uh, for, the, for, for China and the outside world. And let's take a look at the description from both sides of this meeting, right? The Chinese side first. China's uh, foreign ministry described the meeting as, quote, wide-ranging, in-depth, candid, constructive, substantive, and productive. And the media in the U.S. also said the tone of the exchange was positive and cordial, drastically different from the mood at the high-level talks in Alaska, as mentioned by Professor Kuznick. Now, is it a clear sign, Professor Kuznick, that the bilateral relations are now finally heading in a more positive direction, or is it too early to call? I'm afraid it's too early to make that determination. You have to remember that Biden is under a lot of pressure right now. His approval ratings have been plummeting. So they're now down in the low 40s percent. Uh, there's a big election coming up in 2022. Biden has got to, especially in the aftermath of the clumsy withdrawal from Afghanistan, Biden is under a lot of pressure to show that he's going to be tough. And you look at his advisors. I'm very troubled by the fact that he's got 16 members of the Center for New American Security as his main advisors when it comes to U.S.-China relations. This is not only Cam Kurt Campbell, but it's a lot of other people who are responsible for the Asia pivot. These are people who see the competition between the United States and China as being the defining element in our relationship. I think Biden's instincts might be more positive, but he's surrounded by advisors who are pushing for a confrontational policy. And that's what's been Biden's policy from the beginning. The Chinese were very upset. They understood why Biden might have run a hardline campaign uh, an anti during the campaign, criticizing Trump sometimes for being weak on China. But once Biden got into office, he has not backed off. He is, for the most part, double down on Trump's policy toward China. That's very upsetting to the people in Beijing. So now this, this is a positive step. There have been some other positive steps. In September, uh, Ms. Meng was released from, China, from Canada. That was positive. The Chinese reciprocated. Uh, there have been some other positive signs. The joint statement last week from, the, from Glasgow was a very positive sign. So we see that. I think that the United States was recognizing that its hardline confrontational policies were actually leading toward a potential military confrontation over Taiwan or the South China Sea, and the United States has been backing off some of the worst aspects of that, but we're still not in a position, I'm afraid, that we're necessarily on a path toward friendly relations, although I would certainly like to see that. And Professor Fay, you earlier said you would like to see an in-person meeting between the two leaders, right? This meeting was virtual because of the pandemic. And in the past, we would often want to look at clues from two leaders, you know, their facial expressions, body languages, or sideline talks even. Um, do you think the nature of this virtual meeting uh, has affected the communications between the two sides? I think it probably has. You know, uh, research shows that it's uh, more than 50 percent uh, of the information you get is from actually uh, seeing a person, and you do a lot better in that, that seeing and sensing uh, when you're physically meeting with a person. Uh, there's uh, interesting research, for example, that has uh, shown that if you uh, show uh, three pictures of a person's face with uh, different emotions, uh, and uh, also have persons say the same word with these different emotions uh, that people can more often, uh, by a, a ratio of three to two, uh, choose the correct uh, um, emotion uh, based on looking at a picture um, as opposed to uh, hearing a word. So it's really important, particularly in a high-context culture like, uh, like China. Mm -hmm. But we should not lose sight of the fact that this was an important first step uh, things surely have been, uh, you know, in general uh, positive over the last uh, week. Uh, but, um, you know, there's a long road ahead. As, as has been mentioned, uh, it is uh, surely true that it is uh, important to try to separate a little bit Biden's uh, view uh, from what Biden sort of feels that he needs to do uh, because of lots of pressure from both his own party and, and the Republican Party. 
Um, and if we look back to the election campaign against Trump, Biden, for example, uh, criticized uh, the uh, trade policy that, that Trump had uh, implemented, saying that this was uh, uh, not uh, uh, helping uh, the, the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Biden is uh, more pragmatic. I think Biden is actually himself more positive towards China. Uh, but um, it is encouraging uh, that we know that Biden is someone uh, who is predictable. Biden is someone who likes step by step moving towards uh, goals. And that is, I think, much more compatible uh, with uh, President Xi's approach uh, than uh, was Trump, who liked to shock the world to get uh, TV estate, uh, attention, uh, uh, but um, was not very uh, predictable. So I'm hopeful that things can happen uh, to improve the relationships, but it's really important to understand we can't expect this to happen instantly. It is going to be a step-by-step -step process. But this, even this virtual meeting happened almost a year after President Biden took office, right? This is compared to four months after Trump took office, when that first meeting between President Xi and Donald Trump took office. Why the long wait, Professor Kuznick? Well, they did have uh, a couple of phone conversations. Mm -hmm. It's been difficult. We're dealing with the pandemic. Uh, President Xi has not left China for almost two years now. Uh, and so there are a lot of factors that have gone into that. And Biden has been preoccupied with other issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he mm -hmm. still is, given the fact that his approval ratings are, are doing as poorly as they have been, he's got to deal with other issues at home. The United States relations, foreign policy issues are not high on the agenda of the American people right now. And so mm -hmm. Biden is sort of running against the tide here. Uh, and the fact that he doubled down on so many of Trump's policies is very concerning to those of us who are paying attention. Uh, and that, that he has actually increasingly militarized the confrontation. The AUKUS agreement was very, very troubling. Mm -hmm. Not only does it lead potentially to nuclear proliferation, but it further militarizes the conflict. We've seen, especially over Taiwan, we've mm -hmm. seen both sides increasing their war games in the region. We've seen heated rhetoric. I mean, the world had gotten to the point where there's a real understanding that this is potentially going to lead to military confrontation. And nobody wants that because that would be a disaster for humanity. Yeah. As we know, the Pentagon has conducted 18 war games about a mili U.S.-China military confrontation over Taiwan, and China has won all 18 war games. So then what happens from there? Does the United States accept that China can militarily take over Taiwan, or does the United States escalate further? And for those of us who are concerned about the threat of nuclear war, this is really the most troubling thing that's happening now internationally. Mm -hmm. The idea that the United mm -hmm. States was defeated, the Chinese moved very quickly and took Taiwan, would the United States resort to its only res uh, alternative, which would be the use of nuclear weapons? And so this is not just a local conflict. We're talking about a global conflict of the most serious nature right now, which is why the world's eyes have been fixated on this conflict over Taiwan. And the president, President Xi, actually made some strong words on Taiwan in that meeting, right? He issued a warning, basically, saying that supporting Taiwan's independence is basically like playing fire, and anyone playing with fire will get burned. But just last week, a U.S. delegation landed on Taiwan in a military plane. Uh, how, do we, how should we understand America's engagement uh, with this issue, with Taiwan, Professor Kuznick? It's been growing confrontation. Uh, in the last few months. This AUKUS agreement was very, very troubling. What's the point of giving these nuclear-powered submarines to Australia if not to further polarize and militarize? The Biden approach had been to get uh, U.S. allies on board against China, to, to restore America's alliances, which Trump ha had undermined. But it's not in a positive sense. Even the withdrawal from Afghanistan was, was framed that this is an opportunity to refocus America's attention on the real issue, the real enemy, and that's Taiwan. So from the very beginning, the United States has been talking about Taiwan as the pacing crisis, as the 
conflict that the United States has to deal with, the United States has to recognize that we're now in a multipolar world. The old world of American unipolarity, American hegemony, America as the only superpower is gone. That China is on the rise, that Russia in a military sense is a very important power again, and that the United States has got to learn to accept that other countries are also going to have their own interests, and those are sometimes going to be in conflict with the United States. But, but Biden is slowly moving that direction. I think Biden's instincts on that are probably pretty positive, but his policies and his advisors have not been saying that. You've got, you've got Blinken and Sullivan as his main advisors, and they both talk about American exceptionalism and American domination. And Biden, from the beginning, has been saying that the United States is back. But what is that supposed to mean? That the United States is going to reassert itself as the dominant player on the world scene. That's not what the world needs or what the world wants right now. We've got to work together. We've got real issues. The climate issue is obviously very, very pressing, as is the nuclear arms issue and the threat of nuclear war, as is the regional conflicts, as is the pandemic, as is the problem in terms of disparities between the wealthy countries and the poorer countries. We need a lot of collaboration right now. And so the approach of American hegemony is really going to be very, very backward right now. Mm -hmm. The question is, can anybody speak for the planet right now? Can anybody, rather than looking for their own national interests, rather make China great again, make America great again, make Russia, make India great again, can we have people who speak for the planet? And that's the real challenge. And so far, it hasn't really happened, but maybe we're edging in that direction. And maybe this meeting was a positive first sign. And Professor Fay, I do want to get your take on the trade relations between the two countries, right? Recently, U.S. Trade Chief Catherine Tai said that U.S. is getting quote unquote traction with China in a phase one talks. And now, how is Biden administration's trade policy different from that of the Trump? And, you know, currently the United States are suffering the highest inflation rate in the past 30 years, perhaps, and over a dozen uh, trade or business associations in the United States are calling the government to reduce trade tariffs on Chinese goods. Will that happen? Well, um, I, I hope it will, um, but uh, I haven't seen so much positive traction uh, so far that uh, you mentioned. Uh, but I, I do think the stage is, is set that uh, we now hopefully can see some uh, movement going forward. I don't think it can be overstated uh, uh, how uh, occupied Biden has been with domestic priorities, and I think now uh, he will uh, turn uh, more towards uh, this, this trade issue. Um, it has not been good uh, for, for the U.S. It has not been good uh, for China. Um, I, I think that we are now seeing really big disruptions in the supply chain. We see all sorts of companies, uh, even Toyota, who is known for having a phenomenal uh, supply chain, uh, running into problems with this as mm -hmm. one country locks down with the pandemic or has some problem with pandemic and thus supply gets uh, um, uh, broken up. Uh, you know, a key way to deal with this inflation issue would be to uh, solve supply chain issues. A key way to deal with supply chain issues would be to get the pandemic more under control. And maybe this is another way, another area we can see um, possibilities for China and the U.S. Uh, to work together. I, I think, indeed, uh, what we need to see is uh, not uh, U.S. dominance, uh, but a recognition that it is a, uh, you know, a, war a world, rather, that has... Um, uh, a number of, uh, of, of strong uh, uh, nations. And the way that Biden uh, can um, show that he is a true world leader is to bring leader, bringing all countries in the world together to fight uh, some of these important issues. Um, so I'm hopeful that, uh, uh, you know, these tariffs uh, can uh, be reduced. Uh, but I, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. I think it's going to take some time. Well, and now on climate change, Mr. Wan, in a surprise announcement at the COP26 uh, climate summit, China and the U.S. agreed to boost cooperation together on slowing global warming. They signed a joint declaration. They promised to have more working level meetings. What can we expect on that? Well, I think certainly there will be more discussions. I think, you know, that uh, 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 John Kerry and uh, Xie Zhenhua, Minister Xie Zhenhua, have uh, clinched this deal uh, for signing the U.S. on the climate change. This is very significant. I mean, this COP26, without China and the U.S., uh, you know, reach some uh, consensus, I wouldn't say that is a success. But now I think we have done that. 
So now is the issue how we can really, uh, uh, you know, take the benefit of, of this uh, uh, summit, you know, this uh, top-down approach. This head of a state of diplomacy is really working. I mean, at least it works in China. So, so I think hopefully with this we can, you know, have other global governance issues like uh, WTO minister meetings coming up. We have a pandemic fighting is, is really bad uh, that we need both countries to, to demonstrate strong leadership. But also what's more, we talk about trade. Talk, talk about the global supply chain. And also the inflation is running high. So that is really hurting the base of uh, President uh, Biden. You know, all his, uh, all his working class is hurting by this uh, pandemic, hurting by this uh, uh, supply chain crisis, hurting by this inflation. Where China can help, you know, China is also still keeping its uh, huge treasure of U.S. So this China, you know, if they get a good relation with China, that will certainly help President Biden for the midterm election. And also will really, because the business community is really fed up with this kind of a tariff that uh, American consumers are absorbing all the costs, that it really, I think, this kind of a high-level uh, dialogue is really going to send uh, strong messages, uh, signals to the business community, to the working class, and to the you know, Congress that we have to work together, mm -hmm. you know, demonstrate leadership, you know, for, for, for Christ's sake. You know, so let's, let's do that. I mean, that's really important. So I think that uh, this uh, high-level meeting is really a great uh, top-down approach mm -hmm. that going to really, hopefully, will trigger many things to come and it will trickle down uh, to the concrete benefit to both U.S. and China and to the rest of the world. You know, what is happening here between the two countries is really going to have a ripple effect beyond the border, across the world, and a recent draft of the European Union Strategic Compass paper saying that a rising dual polarity is now between the U.S. and China. That is now structuring international competition in virtually all areas. Uh, Professor Kustik, how will European countries position themselves, do you think, and gain more influence than the new world order? Well, the Europeans have tr have been trying to avoid getting caught up in this bipolar conflict. They've got economic ties to China. This is what makes this different in some ways than the earlier Cold War. China is so integrated into the world economy that it's very difficult to have the same kind of Cold War approach that we had between 1945 and 1991. This is a very different situation. China is the main trading partner of most of the countries in Asia and many of the countries in Europe. So nobody wants to see any fu fundamental break with China. And so the Europeans and others have been trying to stay n out of this, really. The United States has been attempting to organize countries to be on one side or the other side in this. And that's a very un, uh, a destructive approach right now. So I think the Europeans are trying to maintain independence, trying to have positive relations with both sides, and trying to tamp down the conflict to make sure it doesn't get worse. Uh, and I think that's the approach that's needed right now. All right, I think that's all the time we have for now. Thank you very much for joining us. That's Professor uh, Peter Kuznick joining us live from Washington, D.C., and Dr. Wang Huiyao joining us live in Beijing. Also, Professor Carl Fei joining us there in Helsinki. Appreciate your insights. That's going to do it for this edition of Dialogue. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you same time tomorrow. Bye for now.